to Afternoons here on RNZ National. And today, we're talking about the incredible life and career of Bert Munro. Uh, a somewhat unlikely success story, Bert grew up in Invercargill, got his first motorcycle around the age of 18, and despite no mechanical training, quickly became obsessed with making them go faster. His lifelong hobby was immortalised when he began visiting the Bonneville Salt Flats breaking three world speed records on his 40-year-old Indian Scout. Most famously, in 1967, at the age of 68, he set a new speed record for a vehicle under 1,000 cc's, 184.087 miles per hour. It's a record which still stands today, unbelievably. To talk to us about Bert's life and with the uh, particularly personal perspective. We're thrilled to be joined today by Bert's son, John Munro. Hi, John. Hello, Jesse. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. I used the word obsessed there in the intro. Do you think that's unfair? No, because I have the same problem. <laughs> Tell me about that. Oh, well, not necessarily with speed, but... Uh... I do get a bit obsessed with things, trying to solve puzzles. I've done, yeah. that, done that through my working life, I guess. Yeah. And this was a lifelong puzzle for Bert, I think. So in terms of your relationship to him and your memories of him, was he into motorcycles as, as, as early as you can remember? Oh, yes, of course. Um, uh, by the time I was born, the... Indian was 14 years old. And what would you like us to remember Bert for? What should he be famous for, do you think? Well, I think um, probably the main thing that he achieved is other people recognising his determination to do things that others considered was impossible or unlikely to be possible. He, um, as you said, he little or no formal training in engineering of any sort, but uh, he just worked on that bike for so many years, averaging it, uh, an annual increase of three miles per hour <laughs> over a uh, 47 year period and uh, that inspired a lot of people I think um, around the motorcycling world and others uh, to investigate their own potentials to see what they could do and I can give you a good example of that from mm -hmm. from uh, a man in the States I was at Bonneville a few years ago and he came up to me and wanted to shake my hand because uh, he said he'd been inspired by Dad and he'd seen the film The World's Fastest Indian and he'd never ridden a boat, motorbike, never, never wanted to own a motorbike but uh, as a result of the film he went out and visited a motorcycle dealer, bought a motorcycle, went and learnt to ride it properly and uh, when I met him on the salt he'd been there the year before this was after only owning the bike for six years and working on it for that period of time. But he came on the salt and broke a class world record. And I, I, wow. think, I think that was, you know, he, he stated that he'd have never done it if he hadn't seen that uh, Dad had done it with no training or so on. So. Mm -hmm. sort of opened the door to his own potential. And I, I think that's what I would like Dad to be remembered for. Yeah, that's less about the record or the, the, the achievement in numbers. It's about what it took to get there and, and that, um, that quality of personality that he had. Yes, that, that's right. It's, uh, I think, you know, just the story of portrayed in the film was the... You know, I've spoken to a lot of people around the world by phone and um, on 
media like this, uh, Zoom, etc. And yeah. that same thing comes across with a lot of people that uh, the inspiration that it's given them to see what they can do. Not, not only in the motorcycling world, but another one, uh, he, he had always liked fiddling with timber. But he'd never really done anything, but he so he started retor restoring old antiques. And uh, now he uh, tells me that he's got an income running up into the uh, hundreds of thousands per annum restoring antique furniture. And he, he stated that uh, he'd have never have done that if he hadn't seen the film. <laughs> For people who don't know the film and don't know the story, the unique part of it is that your dad was interested in going fast and yet he didn't buy new bikes when they came out. He stuck with the same bike, right? He said, this is my bike and I'm just going to keep working and working on it and keep getting it faster and faster and faster. Yes, that's right. That's what he did. It just uh, experimentation with... Uh, various components making, converting, you know, one of the major ones was um, converting the suspension system on the front wheel. And another one was converting the engine to from side valve to overhead valve and he made all the parts for that himself. So it's, um, yes, it's the heart, I think, of progress. Actually, someone said to me a few years ago, they said, uh, mm. if Dad went out now, or someone went out now and, and bought a um, uh, one of the top lines of the uh, current fast motorcycle fraternity, worked on it for 47 years, they'd have that motorbike going at about 800 kilometres an hour. Or 900 kilometers an hour you know if they, yeah. made, if they made the same progress because you know you can buy um, a motorcycle off the shop floor these days it uh, goes a lot faster than dad's ever did but uh, you know if that is converted it's going to be uh, yeah the, the equivalent sort of uh, improvement in speed however that's true though his record still stands for that that's for that size engine is it Yes, it's a class record, um, under a thousand cc, and the engine was originally six hundred and three cc, um, and he worked on that over the years and uh, increased the capacity uh, in various stages up to nine hundred and fifty three cc when uh, he went, and, and each each time he ran, it was in a different class, you know, under, um, I think the first one was under 750cc, mm -hmm. um, and he, he was about, uh, oh, I'd have to <laughs> look back at notes, but, um, you know, it's... No, all uh, good. Yeah. As but as, why, but why hasn't that under 1000cc been broken in almost 60 years? I mean, given all the technology improvements... <laughs> It's incredible. Yes, well, there is a very simple answer to it, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because it might spoil. <laughs> <laughs> what? No one's cottoned on to exactly what he did, is that it? Uh, um, you asked me a question that I said I wasn't going to answer. <laughs> um, uh, no. Uh, I don't want to put you in an awkward position. Oh, you tell me as much as you want, want to tell me, that's fine. You're putting me um, in a very awkward position. <laughs> yeah, saying. no, that's okay. Well, uh, let's move on. But we'll just we'll just <laughs> say that whatever he did has not been replicated. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Yep. That'll, yeah. That'll do. And uh, um, there's all sorts of things that have happened over the period. This might give you a wee bit of a clue and others a wee bit mm. of a clue if they want to start thinking about it, the, over the, well, 
for, for argument's sake, one year Dad got there and they wouldn't let him run because he didn't have fire-resistant overalls to put on, so he had to borrow some. Um, another time he went there, there was a the fuel that he was using um, wasn't allowed to be used. It had to be a different percentage of the various components. So as time changed, so the class that he was running in changed. So that might give you a bit of a clue. Okay. <laughs> Someone smarter than me might have to work that one out and email me. Um, <laughs> do you remember when he, when he broke that record, the one in 1967? Yes, I do, very clearly. Um, Where were you and how did you hear the news? I lived in this terrible place off the coast of New Zealand called the North Island. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yep. Go on. Um, I lived in Auckland for um, well over 40 years, 40 or 50 years. Yeah. I was living in Auckland at the time and uh, I was married and had a family and uh, he... Um, used to come and stay with us and before I'd jump on a ship and tootle off. But um, over that period of time, he was um, discussing changes that he made and he said he thought he was going to get the record on this trip. And mm. it wasn't until we heard it on the news that uh, we heard that he had actually broken the record. Um, he, but prior to that, um, um, the class records that he'd had prior to that were in different classes because um, of lower engine capacity. So, so when he broke the record, that was great, and uh, we welcomed him when he came home in due course. Yeah, I guess they knew who he was by then, but I think when he first went to those salt flats, he. Um people didn't possibly, fair to say, people didn't take him seriously. Oh, yes, absolutely. And that's portrayed in the film a wee bit. Uh, the world's fastest Indian um, director, Roger Donaldson, worked with me, or I worked with him for a few years beforehand and helped with the development of the script and so on. But um, when Dad first went to the Salt in 1962, to compete. He had been there once before just for a look, um, but he went there to, to compete in 1962 and the um, he hadn't even registered, you know, and he, he didn't know that you had to register two months beforehand. And it was only because of two very good friends uh, or bikers that he met there, one Roly Free and the um, the other one um, Marty Dickerson. Marty Dickerson. They befriended him and they were both well known racers and they managed to persuade the uh, powers that be to let Dad have a late registration and they said, Well, you know, this whole bike's not going to do anything, so you better go for a trial run. So he went for a trial run, as portrayed in the film, and uh, they followed him by the car, and he got up to 100 mile an hour, and they were astounded that this old bike was going at 100 mile an hour, and then he, <coughs> as he said afterwards, I, I couldn't get into second gear, and when he finally got into second gear, then... Uh, he was away and left the car behind. They couldn't catch him. <laughs> so that that was fairly fairly typical of dad stuff. It was the yeah the uh, the room inside the shell was pretty cramped. Um, <laughs> so much so, you know, another these rule changes that I mentioned earlier. Uh, dad built. Um, there was another class where the uh, streamliner had to be totally enclosed. So Dad had built a, uh, a cover to fit
fit on, but they wouldn't let him run it because uh, he he couldn't put a he couldn't fit inside it with with a crash helmet on, and he didn't think he needed it because the bike was going to protect him. So he thought uh, they uh, he immediately had to take that off and change the class that he was running in, and because they insisted he have a uh, crash <coughs> helmet, crash helmet, and um, goggles and stuff, you know, so, yeah. One of the things that made him different from other competitors was, I don't think other riders tended to tinker with their own bikes, is that fair? Oh, no, no, that, that's a bit unfair because uh, I would say the vast majority of the ones that run on the salt do um, have A great deal of um, mechanical ability. Um, the ones that don't are employed riders to ride a bike that the owner developing the whole scene, you know, has no uh, has no input in the mechanical scene. Yeah, mind you, I guess what I'm getting at is, I mean, most people would show up at the salts with teams of ten to twenty people. And oh. how many was on Bert's team? A, a bloke called Bert Monroe. Yeah. <laughs> and he won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there's a, <clears throat> quite a few examples of that. Um, um, several of the times that he was there, um, of the nine times he competed there, uh, several of those times he... Um, Mm, lost my thread. Give me a clue. No, you're okay. I've got lots of questions, so don't worry about yeah. me. Okay. Um, including the pain threshold, I, I hear that he could withstand quite a great deal of pain and unfortunately had a couple of opportunities to prove that in his life. Oh, he did. Um, he had several on motorcycles when, uh, during the, the war, the Second World War, he was a in the home guard and he was a dispatch rider and he'd been away on one of their exercises and I can remember him coming home and he'd come off and the footrest had gone right through his ankle well between the between the Achilles and the, the bone and he had got back on the bike and gone to hospital and had it bandaged up I can remember him coming home with this bandaged up foot. But um, another time was at Teratonga near Invercargill, where he came off very high speed at the end of the straight. And uh, he spent some months in hospital after that one. But another one off motorcycles was uh, um, when I was about 11 years of age, so it was about 1945. And he, uh, yeah. Mother, mother used to make our own soap because you couldn't buy soap during the war. Um, well, I guess you could, but mum always used to make it in here. And to make that, uh, it was made with um, tallow, which was uh, brought, brought to a liquid stage in the old copper in the wash house. Yeah. And, and then there was about six or so pints, uh, so let's say three litres of boiling water and a pound of caustic soda dissolved in the oh, water. God. And we only had a coal-fired stove those days and it was winter time and mum had been preparing to make the soap and we're all sitting around the the fireplaces we already did the uh, coal oh, fired no. stove and mother picked up the pot and she had on shoes with worn heel plates and we had a coconut matting flooring in front of the fireplace and uh, her heel caught and she tripped and Dad received the full 
pot of boiling caustic soda in his chest. And uh, so I don't know how long he spent in hospital from that lot, but um, he fortunately, it would have killed him outright. I'm quite sure if uh, he hadn't have had the presence of mind that he always had in times of crisis to leap up, shot at the back door and ran across the yard and jumped in a 400 gallon water tap on the car shed which collected all the water off the roof of the car shed. Uh, he stayed in the water until in due course the ambulance arrived but of course how long that was I have no idea but it must have been it would have to be at least an hour it might have been might have been two hours because we didn't have a telephone of course and, Gosh. and my cell phone was out of order that didn't even get a laugh my cell <laughs> my, my cell it's because it was too dry <laughs> my brain was going yeah, hang on a second what year was this <laughs> Apologies, John. Uh, John Munro is the son of Bert Munro. I've got a few minutes left with him. If you've got anything that you'd like to ask, just don't ask him for his secrets. Were you pleased with the job that Anthony Hopkins did portraying your father? Oh, absolutely. Um, I get asked that question a lot, and my answer is always that um, Tony did a magnificent job, and uh, as I said earlier, I was involved in the um, development of the script over a number of years but Roger was always pleased to make changes on the spot during rehearsals and uh, I was in Bonneville when the film was being made I was there for two or three weeks and uh, oh cool and uh, I was introduced to Tony just call me Tony <laughs> yeah um Sir Anthony Hopkins, sir. and uh, um, he would sometimes come to me and quite frequently and say, how would your dad say this, you know, and he'd read it out of the script and I'd give him my opinion of how a Southlander would have pronounced the words. You That's notice, great. You probably notice with my, my uh, dialect, that I recognise that there are 26 letters in the New Zealand alphabet. <laughs> Including the letter R. Mind you, you had 40 years in Auckland, so you're lucky it hasn't been ground out of you. Yes, well, it's amazing. I was, one of my trips away overseas, someone walked up to me and said, you're from Southland in New Zealand, aren't you? <laughs> so <laughs> that was, uh, I was quite pleased to hear that, but. I hadn't really yeah. That's, uh... hey, I got a text here. I got a story in from uh, Jackie who's listening. She says, My dad was a sheet metal worker in the 1960s, and Bert used to get him to make parts for his bike at Southland Sheet Metal. Bert always had lollies in his pocket that he used to offer dad for doing the job. Does that surprise you, John? That sounds about right. I mean, lollies were very good and very expensive. Like I, <laughs> I used to get six. six marble sized lollies for a halfpenny. half a penny what's that about <laughs> about one hundredth of today's dollars or less yeah hmm oh it's uh well that's nice jackie hello <laughs> um have you ever gotten a bike or shown an interest in uh riding a bike motorbike i have been known to you yeah. i uh Back in the 50s and 60s, I was a milk bar cowboy. Did you ever hear of milk bar cowboys? You're too young for that, I guess. Go on, tell me. Well, milk bar, we used to assemble in Queen Street, in, in that island off the coast of New Zealand. And yeah. uh, mm. outside milk bars, you know, we'd line our bikes up and go and buy a milkshake and create merry hell by just talking to one another. And we were always called the Milk Bar Cowboys. Awesome, yeah. yeah so, Someone wants to know, yeah, sorry, carry on. So yes, I did ride motorcycles. In fact, 
I had three motor motorcycles up until March last year, <clears throat> which uh, I now have no motorcycles in my garage. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to know if there's any truth about weeing on the lemon tree. Well, as I, I think I said before, that everything in the film is based on fact. Mm -hmm. And that is a factual one too. And right. it's a wee bit personal to Roger, so I wouldn't like Roger Donaldson. So, although it's factual, oh no, he has publicised it. No, it's all right, I can tell you. Um, Some time before the film was finished, Roger's father, who lived in Melbourne, in that other island off the coast of New Zealand, um, Melbourne. I'm just so I don't have to be rude to you, John. I'm just going to give you. A, we've got a one minute to the news, uh, oh. and then we do have to cut you off. So give us the short version if you can to finish off our interview today, which we've loved, by the way. Oh yes. Well, he was uh, his father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And Roger put the lemon tree into the film as a tribute to his father. Ah. Yeah, so lemon trees don't grow very well in Invercargill, so, but he introduced, <laughs> introduced that, and I admired him for doing that. Kate remembers Milk Bar Cowboys. She says, what a delightful man. I have to agree, John. If someone wants to know when you're going to write your book. <laughs> well... I don't know whether I, I could write a 10,000 page book because there is so much, you know, I could, I could go on all day, but I guess you've got to let the news in sometime. Yes, uh, the pips are approaching like a freight train. John, <laughs> lovely to have you on the show today. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And regards to all your listeners. John Munro, son of Bert.